Today, we will be talking about the hydrosphere, which is a term that just encompasses all of the water on Earth. Obviously, water is stored in oceans, lakes, and rivers, but water is also stored in ice, the ground, and the clouds. So why do we care about water? Well, water plays an important part in how carbon cycles throughout the world. The oceans store dissolved carbon dioxide. And of course, life on Earth needs water to survive. Life originated in the oceans, where there were plenty of nutrients from volcanic activity. Water, as we'll talk about today, plays an important role in regulating our climate and keeping weather fairly regular. Water also helped to kickstart human civilization, as many cities were founded along rivers or by the coast. And just like volcanoes and earthquakes, water occupies this mythological space. There are rain gods, such as Tlaloc, who are associated with fertility, whereas sea gods like Poseidon are associated with short tempers. In part one, we will discuss oceans, their currents, and how they transport heat around the globe. Later, in part two, we will discuss how surface and groundwater interact with each other and focus in particular on North Carolina's hydrology. Today, we'll start off with a brief explanation of water's chemistry. So first of all, I would like you to stop and think. In eighth grade, you learned a lot about water. Think back to what you remember about its chemistry. Take a moment and then briefly write a few things you already know about its properties and structure. So water's chemical formula is H2O. That tells us that two hydrogens are sharing electrons with one oxygen atom. Now oxygen greedily hogs the negatively charged electrons. So overall, there is a charge imbalance in water that we call polarity. Similar to a magnet, the oxygen end is positively charged, whereas, oh, I'm sorry, the oxygen end is going to be negatively charged, while the hydrogen ends are going to be positively charged. And so water molecules will attract each other fairly strongly in a process called hydrogen bonding. However, these water molecules are not fixed in place, even in ice. They are constantly moving, spinning, and vibrating in random directions, a lot like a system of balls connected by springs. And we quantify this random internal energy as temperature. The hotter a sample of water, the faster the particles will move about. Conversely, the colder a sample of water, the slower the particles. In the case of liquid water and vapor, higher temperatures also result in the water molecules drifting farther apart from each other. This has the effect of decreasing the density since less mass is going to be concentrated in, in a particular volume. Although in the case of ice, we see it float on top of our drinking glasses, which means it must have a lower density than liquid water. This is different from other substances, which normally become closer together, packed in a tight structure when they freeze. Remember back to the geology unit? This is why all the iron and nickel sinks down to the inner core. Water behaves strangely when it freezes. It forms these hexagonal structures, which create more space than there was before, thereby decreasing the density. You've seen a snowflake up close before, this is why you see its beautiful six-sided layout. Also, think about a time when you've boiled water before, maybe to make pasta or a cup of tea. It probably took quite a bit of time. Why do you think this happens? These examples show water's high specific heat capacity. This measures how much heat is required to change the temperature of a substance. In the case of metals, these have lower specific heat capacities, and so will readily heat up, which makes them pretty useful as cooking instruments. Water, though, has a high specific heat capacity, so it will take longer to heat up given the same source of heat. The hydrogen bonds 
those strong attractions between water molecules are responsible for this. Is they're hard to overcome. A lot of energy goes into breaking these bonds instead of agitating the water molecules. Specific heat capacity is an important property in the context of earth science because it helps us to explain how water can moderate the climate. The key takeaway from this chemistry of water is that cold water is going to be denser than warm water, generally speaking. Now that we're familiar with the behavior of water, we'd like to know where we could find it. Now, there are 333 million cubic miles of water on Earth. That is a mind-blowing amount. But that volume is not distributed evenly. Nearly 97% of all water is found in large saline bodies, like oceans, seas, and some salty lakes, such as the Dead Sea in Palestine and uh, the Great Salt Lake in Utah. And if we drank the saline water, it would make us sick. Sorry, it would make us sick. The 3% that we could drink is mostly locked up in ice caps at the poles or glaciers in higher latitudes. There is some of this fresh water available in the ground that we could tap into with wells. So relatively little water is easily accessible in lakes and rivers. We'll talk later in the year about water as a natural resource and how it's important that we moderate our use of it so that everybody can access it. So take another moment to stop and think, and I'd like you to think about the different processes which could move water around these different reservoirs, and then write a brief explanation as to why these processes happen. So we call all the processes which change the form of water the water cycle. Now, you've learned about the water cycle many times over your school history, so we'll make this summary brief. The key takeaway here is that sun and gravity are the main drivers of water's motion here. The sun will heat up water and turn it into vapor, which can be stored in the atmosphere as clouds. Plants also release water in their process of growing. Now, gravity will eventually bring this water back down in the form of precipitation, rain, snow, that kind of thing. At high altitudes, water can freeze and be stored as ice at the top of mountains. So when it melts, this water can now flow down the mountain and form streams and even greater rivers. At depressions in the land, this water can be stored in lakes. And water gradually infiltrates through the land over time and moves into and through the ground. We'll talk about this more in part two. So over time, gravity will move all of this surface water back into the ocean and the cycle will continue. So this is probably why we see the bulk of water stored in the oceans. Here are some key words about the water cycle for your reference. Be sure to write these down before you continue. So today we're going to talk about the oceans, which is one interconnected water system. Although typically we geographically divide up the oceans into the Atlantic, which is to the east of north of the Americas, the Pacific, which is to the west of the Americas, the Indian Ocean, which lies between Africa, the Indian subcontinent, Indonesia and Australia, the Arctic Ocean, which is far to the north above Canada and Russia, and the Southern Ocean, which is around the southern continent of Antarctica. Now, you may have heard the term seas before, like the Mediterranean Sea, or the Caribbean Sea, these are just bodies of water that are partially enclosed by land. For example, the Mediterranean Sea 
is bounded by Southern Europe and North Africa. Water can move between the different parts of the ocean in flows called currents. It's not just staying in the same place all the time. Water can move around between different parts of the world. Water can absorb and store heat in one part of the world, and then currents can move that warm water around to other parts. Or similarly, water can be cooled in other parts of the world, particularly the poles, and currents can transport that around too. Water can also transport animals, and in the case of people, sailors, in order to speed up their travel around the world. And currents also move nutrients around the world, as we'll talk about a bit later. Now, there are two main types of ocean currents. The first type, you've probably seen before, if you've ever filled a glass with water and blown across the top. You see little waves forming along the surface there. These surface currents are caused by friction with the wind. And the top layers of the ocean will then move along the layers directly below it. But this process only continues to go down a few hundred meters. Deeper down in the oceans, those are also still moving, but they're moved by convection currents driven by differences in density. So take a moment to observe these patterns in the ocean currents. After you finish making your observations, what patterns do you see? Explain why you think the water flows that way. So the main explanation for these gyre-like behaviors is a phenomenon called the Coriolis effect, which is just a deflection that occurs due to rotation. Imagine that you're sitting in the middle of a merry-go-round and your friend or a younger sibling is out of the merry-go-round observing you. You have a ball with you and you push it along towards your friend. Now, from your perspective, being rotated along the merry-go-round, the ball will look as if it travels in a straight path. However, to your friend, more objective observer, the ball will appear as if it's curving because it's moving along a rotating surface. The earth, because it's rotating, will exhibit a similar effect. So air should rise at the hot equator where the sun hits the earth directly. That air will then move towards the poles in a convection current where it sinks at the poles and should flow back toward the equator in a cycle. And if the earth were not rotating, this would go linearly directly from the equator towards the north or south pole. But things are more complicated than that because earth rotates about 15 degrees of longitude every hour. And because of this rotation, the motions of the air are going to be deflected. In the northern hemisphere, winds are going to be deflected to the right, whereas the opposite occurs in the southern hemisphere, and all winds are going to be deflected to the left. So what this creates is a pattern of prevailing winds over the Earth. These are marked on this map as gray arrows. Very close to the equator, within 30 degrees latitude, we see trade winds pushing to the west. A bit north and south of that, between 30 and 60 degrees, are the westerly winds. They're called that way because they come from the west and flow to the east. At even more extreme latitudes than that are the polar easterlies. Those flow from the east to the west. Now take a moment and notice what connections you see between the directions of the winds and the ocean currents. We know that the winds push surface currents along 
for example, the South Equatorial Current, which goes between Africa and South America, is pushed along by the trade winds. But when that South Equatorial Current hits the coast of Brazil, that water is going to divide. Some of it will go to the north, some of it will be bounced back towards Africa, and some of it will flow south towards Antarctica as the Brazil current. Then, when that water in the Brazil current reaches the Antarctic Circle, it's going to cool down and form a gyre. We see many of these gyres occurring all over the world. Now, these gyres have pretty complicated motion, so in this introductory course, we're just going to talk about the basics here. In the case of North America, where we live, we experience ocean currents on both the east and the west coast that help moderate our climate. Because of water's high specific heat, it can store energy, which these currents bring to another location. For example, here on the east coast, we're affected by the Gulf Stream, which brings warm water north from the Gulf of Mexico along the coast of the United States. This warm water can also reach Europe and warm places like Great Britain. But on the west coast, they experience the opposite effect. Their California current brings cold water south from the poles and keeps the west coast locally colder. But cold currents, like the California current, aren't driven by wind. Cold water is denser, so it would sink down to a point where it is not really affected by these winds. So we need to consider other factors that must be able to explain these types of currents. Let's first consider the temperature of the ocean. So the sun emits electromagnetic radiation as we talked about in our astronomy unit. And when this radiation collides with water, the molecules begin to jiggle at a faster and faster rate. This is the same principle that lets microwaves cook your food. But the sun can only heat up the upper layer of the ocean. This electromagnetic radiation can only penetrate so far before it is completely absorbed. And because the ocean water absorbs red wavelengths first, that's why it appears blue. At lower latitudes, near the equator, the sun is going to hit most directly, so the surface will be warmest there. Whereas at the poles, the more oblique angle means there is less sun exposure, so the surface will be colder. Now, right below the surface is a region called the thermocline. This extends from about 300 to 700 meters below the surface. This is a region where the temperature declines steeply due to the less amount of solar radiation penetrating deeper. And this is less pronounced at higher latitudes because the sun doesn't play as much of an influence there. Below 700 meters is the deep layer, where the water is very, very cold, about four degrees Celsius. And notice there are some patterns here in the seasonal change of the distributions. Look at the tropical regions near the equator. These have a more consistent thermal distribution because the seasonal differences aren't really that big there. Whereas at the poles, there is a large swing in surface temperatures between summer and winter. Almost 8 degrees Celsius as shown in the graphs here. In the geology unit, we talked about how mantle convection was driven by heat below the, from the core. But here, the temperature of the ocean is hottest at the top and so the water will be least dense there. So theoretically, this should be a stable situation. The hot water should stay on top of the cold. So then why do the oceans overturn? Take a moment 
and think about some of the other factors that may be at play. One of those key factors is the ocean's salinity. The ocean has a wide variation in salt content, and this is the other key driver for the difference in density that drives the motion of deep ocean currents. On average, ocean water is 96.5% water and 3.5% salt. So if you took a kilogram of water and boiled it off, you would be left with about 35 grams of sea salt. This is mostly made up of the, of the mineral halide, sodium and chloride, which makes up our common table salt. But sea salt has lots of other ions in it. For example, sulfate, magnesium, calcium, bicarbonate, etc. Ocean water even has traces of uranium in it. And while that resource is limited on the continents and quite hazardous to mine, Scientists have figured out some ways to extract some limited amounts from seawater. But this begs the question, how did the ocean get so salty to begin with? Well, runoff from rivers and streams carries minerals and sediments down, and those are dissolved in the water and carried into the ocean. Volcanic activity has also released chemicals and minerals into the water, which dissolve there. But these processes are constantly carrying salt into the oceans, so why doesn't the ocean just keep getting salty? There are processes which also remove the salt. So sea spray, when waves wash up onto the beach, really salts. Chemical reactions with rocks and organisms also work to remove some of these chemicals from water. For example, um, Creatures that use shells take up calcium from the water in order to build up a rigid calcium carbonate protective layer. These processes of addition and removal keep the amount of salt in a steady state. Now, the more salt that water has, the denser it's going to be. The positive ions, such as sodium, will be attracted to the oxygen well, negative ions like calcium are going to be a I'm sorry. Well, negative ions like chloride are going to be attracted to the hydrogen. These ions wedge their way between water molecules and fill in the gaps, adding additional mass into the same volume, which will work to increase the density. Now, the main processes that increase the salinity of water are evaporation and freezing. Evaporation takes out the liquid water and leaves behind the salts. We see this in the Mediterranean Sea, for example, where there is a high evaporation and low rainfall over the sea, so the salt becomes very concentrated there. Salinity also increases at the poles. Sea ice that forms near the very cold poles um, freezes the water around it. And when this freezing happens, the dissolved salts in the water cannot stay in the crystal structure of the ice, and so they will fall out. This very cold, very salty water sinks down to the floor of the ocean and becomes what's called bottom water. This occurs both near the Antarctic and in the Arctic Ocean. Very slowly, this bottom water moves out towards the equator. But water is not compressible like gas. You can't cram an infinite amount of water into the same space. If some of it sinks, it has to rise somewhere else. This gives rise to the thermohaline circulation. Thermo, meaning temperature, and haline, meaning salt. These two factors are going to drive the density differences and cause deep currents to overturn and become surface currents. When the surface currents reach the Arctic Ocean, their heat gets released into the air 
and helps to warm up the poles. This passes along stored solar energy like a big giant heat pump. The ocean can also act like a giant heat sink. It stores heat in the summer months and then gradually releases it over the course of the winter, helping to keep Earth's temperatures more and more stable. But this is a delicate, complicated system, and it depends on this formation of bottom, of bottom warm, sorry, of bottom water to drive this process. So if the sea ice goes away, then we would expect the thermohaline circulation to change. And climate change may result in the slow or shutdown of this conveyor belt. So take a moment to stop and think and imagine what would happen if water did not have such a high specific heat capacity. How do you think the climate would be affected if this property were different? Please take a few seconds to write down a response and explain your reasoning. In addition to transporting heat around the Earth, the thermohaline circulation is also able to recycle nutrients in the ocean. So ocean organisms like phytoplankton need these nutrients to survive. And other marine organisms have to eat those phytoplankton in order to survive. But these phytoplankton deplete nutrients from the surface and they'll sink down when they die. This brings all the nutrients from the surface down to the bottom. In order to bring the nutrients back up, this is where the process of upwelling takes place. Winds blowing near the coast will move warm surface water out away from the shore. And because water isn't compressible, if it moves away, some of it has to take its place. This drives cold, nutrient-rich water back up towards the surface. This often occurs along coastal areas and can help create thriving ecosystems there. However, a great case study for the delicate and complicated nature of the ocean system is the El Nino Southern Oscillation. This is an irregularly periodic cycle. It occurs every few years for months at a time. Although the mechanism that drives this has not been fully fleshed out yet. Now, normally in the Pacific Ocean, trade winds transport warm air and water to the West Pacific in a process called the Walker circulation. However, El during an El Nino period, these prevailing winds weaken or reverse, which switches the direction of the walker circulation and moves the focus of rainfall from the Australia and Indonesia area to South America. Warm water also stays near South America and suppresses the upwelling, which usually occurs there. In La Nina, the switchback from El Nino this intensifies the normal state, and so more rains will occur over Australia, and more intense uprising, or sorry, upwelling will happen near South America. The way that I remember it, La Nina has a bunch of A's in it, just like Australia. So in La Nina, that's where more rains happen in Australia. This oscillation can lead to extremes in weather and cause floods in areas that usually don't get a lot of rain, or droughts in areas that do, which can be really harmful for the societies affected by this. But the key takeaway from all of this is that water's high specific heat is able to store energy for long periods of time. And this is why the Southern Oscillation can be sustained for months at a time. So remember, Water is an energy agent. It is capable of moving heat energy around the Earth. That's all for today. Next week, we'll be talking about how surface and groundwater interact with each other. Have a good day.